Okay. Good afternoon. Welcome to the New America Foundation. My name is David Gray, and I direct the Workforce and Family Program here. On behalf of the Washington Monthly and the New America Foundation, we welcome you to this event, Can Washington Power Up American Inventiveness? A Conversation on Innovative Entrepreneurship. Welcome as well to press and to those joining as we webcast this live. Earlier this year, the New America Foundation and the Washington Monthly began working more closely as a means to extend the discourse on some pressing topics and to advance the way in which both organizations are promoting big, innovative ideas. And entrepreneurship is about big ideas. The economic crisis of the past year, as you know, led to the stimulus package and now talk of a jobless recovery and an additional stimulus package. And stimulating the economy is, of course, both necessary and wise. But the current focus on stimulus is but a short-term focus, and we need to be thinking beyond the stimulus. Entrepreneurs and small businesses are the backbone of the American economy, as you know, comprising some 99% of overall total employers and creating 75% of our nation's new jobs. <coughs> So for the medium to long term, given that most of the net new job growth for decades now has come from innovative startups and small businesses, the important policy question over the long term is, what can Washington do to spur innovative entrepreneurship? Now one dynamic we see in DC these days and in recent years has been how the two political parties have viewed entrepreneurs and small businesses. Republicans have traditionally been seen as a voice of small business and entrepreneurs. Groups like the National Federation of Independent Business and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce tend to be aligned more closely with GOP members. Recently, the main GOP alternatives to President Obama's main economic policies on the domestic side were small business-focused responses. So, for example, Republicans argue that the stimulus package recently passed did not help small businesses and entrepreneurs enough and that the health care reform that is racing through Washington will be paid largely on the backs of small businesses. We saw a bit of this in Meet the Press yesterday, and certainly on Fox News last week, House Minority Whip Eric Cantor made the focus of his remarks on the need for tax cuts, tax cuts, and more tax cuts as the appropriate policy response to help small businesses and entrepreneurs. Raising the question, of course, is are small businesses only in need of tax cuts as the appropriate policy response? Democrats, too, claim to support entrepreneurs, but as entrepreneurs and small businesses have often been seen as a GOP constituency, Democratic policies at the national level and at the state level as well have often favored labor unions and employees, sometimes at the expense of entrepreneurs. To develop salient policies that spur long-term growth for startups and long-term job growth for the economy, both sides of the aisle need to rethink their approaches to policies that impact entrepreneurs and small businesses. For Republicans in the era of increased government action, there's a need for new ideas that support entrepreneurs. For Democrats, there is a need to realize that the gap between Democrats and the businesses themselves may not be as great as the gap between Democrats and the business groups in DC. So they might find fertile ground in prioritizing policies that help entrepreneurs and small businesses in new and creative ways. So what policy should Washington pursue to help these vital sectors? To discuss these issues, we are pleased to be joined by a distinguished panel. You have more complete bios outside, but let me briefly introduce our speakers as a way of introduction. In a moment, we will be joined by Robert Lighton, who is the Vice President for Research and Policy at the Ewan Marion Kaufman Foundation in Kansas City and a real leader in the field. We've appreciated Kaufman's longtime leadership and appreciated their sending people to our entrepreneurship conference at New America in 2006. You'll be hearing from Bob a bit later. Mariah Blake is an editor at the Washington Monthly, and as you may know, the Washington Monthly produced an excellent package of stories on the subject we're discussing today, which I believe you can find outside already, and I've seen many of you flipping through already this afternoon. So, Mariah, thank you for being here. And Paul Glasteris is the editor-in-chief of the Washington Monthly and a senior fellow here at New America. And so I hope that today we'll be able to discuss some of what Mariah and Paul and others at the Washington Monthly have put together in terms of their report, certainly the state of government policy towards entrepreneurs 
and small businesses, and ideas that can bring some fresh thinking to this important sector. And we look forward to your questions and discussions to follow. So we'll begin with Paul Glasteris from the Washington Monthly. Paul? Thank you. Thank you, David. Thanks for everybody for coming. Uh, appreciate it. The, uh, the uh, news of the day or the week provides an alarming uh, uh, news hook to this, uh, to this gathering. Uh, the growing awareness among, welcome, Bob. Uh, the growing awareness uh, uh, in Washington, in New York, uh, uh, throughout the country that what we're uh, experiencing or likely to experience is this economy we hope begins to turn around as more steam is built up is the uh, prospect of a jobless recovery. We had a, a, a eight years of um, relatively okay GDP growth in, in this decade, um, but uh, something like a third as many jobs created as, as what we experienced in the 90s. And uh, many think we could be in for an even worse job creation and wage uh, creation uh, cycle in, in, in the coming years. Uh, this is a very frightening uh, prospect, and uh, it, it uh, is one that I think the, a focus on entrepreneurship and innovation in general, uh, uh, that we need to be being putting a lens of entrepreneurship and innovation in general on the policies that are being debated in this town, much more so than, than we have. And I think David was very right uh, that, that liberals need to think differently uh, about entrepreneurship, or rather, liberals need to think more about entrepreneurship when they're factoring policy, and 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 conservatives need to think differently about it. Um, now, in February, the uh, nonpartisan Washington-based Information Technology and Innovation Foundation released a study, uh, which wasn't the worst news of that period, but uh, was nothing to cheer about. It it compared the U.S. to 39 other countries. Uh, on their innovation-based global competitiveness scale, everything from the number of new business startups to the availability of venture capital, high-speed broadband access, corporate uh, and government R&D spending. And overall, the U.S. did okay on the rankings, uh, a respectable sixth behind countries like Sweden and, and South Korea. Um, but in terms of progress on these indicators, since 99, we scored dead last. Um, now, there is a connection between the capacity to innovate and the financial crisis that we've just gone through and are still in many ways suffering from, and it's, it's one worth examining. Both have their roots in the last decade, in the, in the 90s, where we experienced just an astonishingly healthy growth in, in, uh, in jobs, in, in, in uh, wages, driven primarily by the diffusion of Ever, com ever cheaper computing power and the expansion of the internet. Now, when that boom ended in the uh, uh, famous dot-com bust, it was a sign, uh, and it was a sign that there was too much capital chasing too few opportunities. Um, and a lot of people knew this, a lot of people talked about this. If you go back to the year 2000, and uh, you read Wired magazine or went to venture capital conferences or um, the op-ed pages or whatever, you, you, you remember what people were talking about back then as the next big thing, the, the, the next frontier for technology, for economic growth. It was the smart grid. It was healthcare IT. It was renewable energy. Uh, uh, these, were, these were the kinds of things that people were talking about. They... They, they were the platforms the, uh, on which that entrepreneurs would be able to build new companies, jobs, and wealth. Um, to open up these kinds of opportunities would have required, always requires in, many, in, in most instances, some government action, often I I immense government investment. And uh, people were talking about that also, but uh, we did not invest over the last eight years in these platforms. We did not build out the the broadband uh, uh, infrastructure, which people have been talking about since the 80s. We did not make really any moves toward, uh, very modest moves toward uh, the smart grid. Uh, really, the reigning theory at that time was that 
investors would find their own opportunities, that government's role would, would be limited to uh, getting out of their way, maybe taking down some uh, burdens, some regulatory burdens, freeing up capital, keeping interest rates low, et cetera. Uh, and the uh, and so we what you what you had instead was a policy to as I said keep interest rates low um, and build up the housing market. Um, it's sort of horrible to think about now, but had the trillions that got invested in uh, exurban real estate and shopping malls and so forth uh, in the last eight years been invested instead in broadband, in the smart grid, in healthcare IT, in some of these other things that people were talking about eight, nine, ten years ago, we might be at a period now where investors would have the platforms they needed to see some return uh, on their ventures. We didn't, but uh, I, I don't think that it's the, this next stage capitalism is, is too late to, to, uh, to happen. Um, I, I do think that it requires as we make policy, as we talk about policy in this town, thinking not in terms of, uh, not in terms of the short term. I mean, we, we're, on, we're in an in emergency situa- situation now, and it's understandable that we're talking about um, shovel-ready infrastructure projects, and we're talking about immediate uh, job growth. Um, I don't think the historic literature suggests that in the midst of an economic crisis that government can engineer quick, immediate growth in jobs through investment in platforms. And and you can get jobs through infrastructure spending in terms of people digging uh, 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 fiber optic cables. But the businesses that arise through the platform of a fiber optic cable, the, let's say, Multiplayer video gaming, as is t- as is a, a huge and growing uh, sector in South Korea, whose broadband uh, uh, speeds and capacity are many fold faster than ours. Um, countries that have those platforms do get the first mover advantage in many cases. Um, so any investment that we were to make now um, is not necessarily going to pay off in the next twelve months or two years, but in terms of long-term ability of this country to create cutting-edge, high-wage jobs, um, it is the investment in these platforms, which, as I said, many of which we've known about for some time, that that are key. Um, I mentioned broadband. Uh, let me just very briefly give some examples of the kinds of things that um, you'll find in the package that that uh, that uh, are being discussed right now. Uh, uh, in in Congress and in, in the Obama administration, uh, as I said, the 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 sort of balky, expensive, slow broadband that we have here, we think we have good broadband. Uh, one needs only go to 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 Japan or 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 Australia. Australia's internet access is three times better than ours. Uh, if you in terms of uh, if you divide cost by speed. Uh, their, their broadband is three times better. France's is nine times better. Japan's 21 times better. Again, they're, they've built out the platforms and are, uh, are uh, in a position to, to move into those uh, industries that use that platform. Now, the Obama administration has, I think it's about $7 billion in stimulus money that is devoted to building out the broad, uh, broadband in rural areas. It's a sort of down payment, a good thing to do. Um, that's not, I think, where the action is. Um, that's not where we're going to get the orders of magnitude increase in this that that is needed. Um, uh, in our issue, Nick Nicholas Thompson of New America and uh, Wired Magazine suggests a few ideas for things that, that we could do relatively quickly and uh, uh, not without controversy, but for instance, changing regulations on uh, service providers to get to that last mile of pipe, that last mile of fiber optic cable from the, from the main fiber optics that stretch across the country to each of our houses and businesses. That's the key, how to do it. Um, for instance, ask, have a regulatory scheme where uh, providers are 
uh, pay the subsidy if they uh, pipe into your home. They get nothing if they pipe one fiber optic cable into their home. They get a subsidy if they pipe two or three and then rent the other two or three to competitors. That will allow uh, f for you to have uh, more uh, offerings and to keep prices down and uh, speeds up. Um, so that's the kind of thing that uh, I believe it's in February of next year, the Obama administration is going to be putting forth a, a, a paper uh, arguing uh, for their position on broadband. I, I don't know if you saw the Washington Post today, the new FCC commissioner, Julius Janikowski, is, you know, in terms uh, that uh, warm our hearts, talking about innovation and small players in the, in the provision of, uh, of, uh, of broadband and other uh, forms of communication. So there's certainly some who get it. Um, another aspect of this uh, that we talk about in the, in the, in the package is immigration. Um, for the last two or three years, we've been obsessed with illegal immigration, talking endlessly about, about compromises to provide um, some form of amnesty to illegal immigrants uh, in return for border security and so forth. Very uh, insufficient uh, focus has been on, on legal high-end immigration. Um, and it's been a, 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 a great boon to this country uh, to uh, bring in uh, graduate students who uh, uh, come with some education, uh, are taught in our universities, and more often than not take their talent and uh, all that we've invested in them and take it back to their home countries. Um, we believe, and, and T.A. Frank argues so in this package, that any uh, foreign student who graduates from an American university um, ought to get a visa stapled to his diploma, a green card stapled to his diploma, welcome to the United States. Um, uh, uh, Duke University and the University of Chicago, University of California's uh, Berkeley study found that a quarter of technology and engineering startups in the United States were uh, their founders were foreign born, and um, half of Silicon Valley startups have at least one immigrant founder. This is low hanging fruit, as they like to say, something that we can do immediately to, uh, to seed the ground of entrepreneurship in this country. Um, another, just going to throw out a, 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 one more idea. We have seen in the last few years a nascent new banking industry begin to evolve in this country. You may have heard of these peer-to-peer -peer lending uh, companies that operate almost solely on the web, um, sort of like eBay for loans. Um, they were doing two, $300 million in lending um, up until October when the FCC uh, decided that they ought to be regulated. Um, and uh, it was a bit of a blow to the industry. Uh, they, many of the major players went dark, stopped making loans, absolutely the wrong time for a nascent new uh, 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 seed capital industry to go dark, but they did. Uh, as of last week, the biggest player is back, uh, back online, beginning to make loans, um, now uh, fully regulated. Um, let's hope it was the right kind of regulation. Let's hope that uh, what the SEC has done is provide a safe environment uh, for the kind of lending, especially to entrepreneurs, that you're not seeing right now in, in, out of many of the uh, uh, many parts of the banking industry, so again, uh, it, it's important to to uh, put a lens of entrepreneurship on the policies that we that we uh, that we talk about, um, and uh, th this uh, this uh, uh, special report that we've put forth is our attempt to try to do that. Uh, we think we've gotten. Uh, a good response you know, from Congress, from the administration. We know that um, the, the FCC is reading our, uh, our broadband piece, so, so uh, we're trying to do our little part. Now, um, one of the key aspects of this, and I, I think uh, maybe Bob will, I hope, talk a little bit about, is uh, uh, health care. Um, this is a vitally important uh, area that, for entrepreneurship that doesn't get talked about in that way. Um, the debate about about health care has been couched as, as would be normal as, in terms of health care, but it is also uh, w an aspect of life for someone considering opening their own shop, 
quitting a corporate job, quitting a safe job to go out on their own uh, with a family, are you going to make that move and put your family's health care at risk? Universal health care provides the, provides the safety net that allows experimentation and risk-taking. And um, there is evidence, again, you'll see in the package, that universal health care done right would actually increase the amount of entrepreneurship in this country. Um, but it has to be done right. And I'll let Bob talk a little bit more about how that could be. So uh, thank you for coming. And uh, read, the, uh, read the section. And uh, look forward to answering your questions. Thanks uh, very much, Paul. Uh, now, Mariah Blake. Right. Hello, everyone. So I'm going to talk about an industry where there hasn't been much innovation in the last five, uh, five decades or so, and, and that is the electricity sector. Uh, there's very few in industries where there has been so little innovation as there has been in the electricity sector. Uh, basically, in the last five decades, the rest of our economy has become smarter and more interactive, uh, but our electrical grid is still based on 1950s technology. And the result of this is a dumb one-way system where customers have little access to information about how much energy they're using, and power companies have only crude tools to manage the flow of electricity and to diagnose and repair problems. So. The best example of this, when power goes out in most parts of the country, the only remedy is to send out a truck to hunt for the, for the down power lines. Uh, and virtually every other part of our economy is digitized. We have remote detection. Um, but this is not the case with our electrical system. Um, and this, this lack of innovation creates a drag on our economy. On outages alone cost about $100 billion a year. It also leads to enormous inefficiency and waste. Uh, there's now a plan in the pipeline to deal with this. Um, the Obama administration has the goal of building a smart grid, and many of you have probably heard of the smart grid. Um, there's, there's a lot of buzz about it. Um, but I think many people are not aware of, of exactly what it entails and the policy obstacles um, to creating a fully functional smart grid, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. So a smart grid essentially means outfitting every part of our electrical system, from the hot water heaters to the power lines with digital intelligence. Um, and the idea is to make the power system a robust, uh, excuse me, robust programmable platform similar to the Internet. If done properly, this could revolutionize the way we use energy. Not only will it allow power companies to manage the flow of electricity on a micro level and remotely diagnose and repair problems, it will allow individuals to become active participants in managing our power supply. Uh, building a smarter grid is also, also has the potential to spur innovation in dozens of industries, from green energy to appliance manufacturing to automaking. Um, and it is basically the key to reaching many of our energy goals. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, so one of the goals of the Obama administration is to put a million plug-in hybrid cars on the road by 2015. This would bring sweeping innovation to the automotive industry. And it could also have huge environmental benefits. Uh, Plug-in hybrids will need far less gas than our current generation of hybrids because our current generation of hybrids, uh, the way that they generate electricity is through braking and acceleration. So that it's, it's limited. Um, they do not tap into the grid. Uh, however, our aging grid is already basically running on the edge of failure. If you had millions of cars plugging into it, uh, it would become difficult to manage. And some say it would be impossible. Um, also, if plug-in hybrids, or if, if hybrids were plugging into our current grid, it would have the, uh, the perverse effect of making us more dependent on coal, and this is a fact that many people don't know. Um, but Oak Ridge National Laboratories recently studied what would happen if a quarter of our automotive fleet was, was plug-in hybrids. And uh, if they were plugging into our current grid, we would have to build 160 new power plants, most of them coal-fired power plants, in order to accommodate that. Um, however, if our grid were smart, cars could be programmed to power up when demand is lowest, say, uh, in the middle of the night, and to coordinate their charging times. In that case, it's possible that we wouldn't need to build a single new power plant. Um, 
it would also make it far easier to manage, a smarter grid would make it far easier to manage the, the surge in demand that would come with plug-in vehicles. So in essence, really without a smart grid, we, we will not, probably never have a large percentage of our vehicles being plug-in hybrids. A uh, smarter grid is also key to the widespread deployment of green energy, something the Obama administration is counting on to create millions of green collar jobs. Uh, as most people here know, renewable energy is variable. Wind, windmills turn only when the wind is blowing. Uh, and, and solar panels only produce power when the sun is shining. Uh, because grid operators only have crude tools to manage the flow of electricity, a, sud a sudden surge of power can throw off the entire balance of the system. And so what this means is that our current grid can only handle about 10 to 20 percent renewable energy, um, if that, according to some experts. However, once you add digital intelligence to the grid along with energy storage, it becomes possible to bring huge quantities of renewable energy online. And interestingly, regarding the storage piece, if you have the combination of smart grid and plug-in hybrid vehicles, you can also use the batteries of the vehicles as a vast distributed storage network. So um, what happens is basically you have this, this vibrant interactive network where the various pieces are interacting. Um, Perhaps more importantly, if done right, the smart grid can give consumers the tool to save energy and money while helping to make the entire system more efficient. And the most striking example of this is Boulder, Colorado, where the power company XL Energy is building the first fully functional smart grid. Um, and this means more than 50,000 homes are being outfitted with smart meters and smart appliances. And uh, significantly, consumers are also being transitioned to, to time-based pricing. And this means that energy prices vary minute by minute based on demand and other factors like the prices that utilities pay. Uh, in most part of the, parts of the country, we pay flat rates for, for electricity. So as a result of this, Boulder residents can log on to the internet and get minute by minute breakdown of how much energy every device in their home is using. Now this alone has been shown to drive down energy use by 15% or more. Um, but in addition, they can also pro they can program their appliances to operate way in ways that save them energy and money. So for example, dishwashers and dryers can be set to run only when demand is low and the price, the price of energy drops. Or they can be set to run only when windmills are turning. Um, Similarly, solar panels can be set to feed electricity back into the grid when the price of energy spikes, um, and, and uh, plug-in hybrids can be set to charge only when the prices are low. Uh, and essentially what's, what's happening here is you have a vibrant energy ecosystem where you're using price signals to encourage people to use energy in a way that makes the entire system more efficient. Um, so the system is supposed to drive down energy use by 20% or more and shift the remaining energy use away from periods of peak demand, which is when the, the dirtiest and most expensive power plants are turned on. Um, as a result, it will drastically cut the city's carbon emissions and save residents millions of dollars on their electricity bills. So that's the good news. Um, that, that speaks to the potential of the smart gr grid. The bad news is that there are some – oh, wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, the bad news is that there are some major barriers, policy barriers, to creating a fully functional smart grid. And the most significant is our outdated regulation. So our system for regulating electricity stems from the 1930s. Many people don't know this, but um, basically at the time, in the 1930s, a law was passed to curb the abuses of these national electricity conglomerates that were, that were gobbling up these small electricity providers and, and charging uh, customers inflated rates for power. So the entire system is is geared towards addressing those problems. And so it's essentially utilities are limited in their geographic reach. They're given monopoly over the, the region that they serve. And they have to answer to state regulators who set rates based on two factors, which is how much power, how many power plants are built and how much power they generate. The idea of the system was to keep prices low and, incur and to encourage power companies to provide um, electricity to their entire service area. And that made a lot of sense at a time when 90% of of rural population didn't have electricity. Um, but, but the landscape has changed dramatically since that time. Obviously, today our biggest challenge isn't producing enough electricity. It's finding ways to make the system more efficient and to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. Um, and the system continues to reward power companies for churning out more electricity and for building more power plants. And that essentially uh, stifles stifles investment in, in a lot of innovative technologies uh, that have the potential to make our electricity system more efficient. So uh, the smart grid being one. This is, this is a large part of the reason that our entire electrical system is still based largely on 1950s technology. Um, 
In addition, those utilities that try to invest in smart technologies or other efficiency measures often find themselves stymied by regulators. There's just basically no place in their depression area calculations for technologies that, that save money by, for example, not building more power plants. Everything is geared towards, towards generation. Um, and there's a limited amount that the federal government can do because uh, electricity re regulation is, is the domain of states. Um, but co Congress and the Obama administration have taken certain steps to try to remedy this. So for example, in the stimulus package, there's $4.5 billion for smart grid investments. Um, this could help overcome, this could help to overcome the inertia that has kept power companies from investing in smart technologies at all. But this is really just a drop in the bucket. It'll take about 20 times that much money to in, uh, outfit our entire grid with digital technology. Um, and, and technology alone will do only so much good. Um, there are additional steps that need to be, to be uh, taken. So for example, once you install digital sensors on the grid and, and smart meters, uh, you no longer have to send out uh, a meter reader to read, to read the meter. That's an advantage. Um, you can detect and repair problems remotely, so you don't have to send out a truck to, to hunt for that down power line anymore. However, you don't necessarily get the most important benefits, such as cutting energy usage or shifting energy usage away from periods of peak demand. To that, you really have to open the field to ordinary people. So, and this is what was happening in Boulder, where you have ordinary people can program their appliances to make the system more efficient. Um, and I guess the, the probably the best parallel is, is the difference between uh, mainframes and PCs. So uh, when you introduce the original IBM mainframes, you've got certain advantages businesses could streamline their operations. Um, but it was only the, with the ar arrival of the personal computer and later the internet that allowed all of these individual computers to be networked into this vibrant interactive uh, network that uh, we got the tsunami of in innovation that brought us things like Google Earth and Twitter. So, so the question is, how do we turn our grid? P what policies do we use to turn our grid into this kind of vibrant interactive network? Um, and the most important, most important thing is that we need to deploy the smart grid technology in a way that gives consumers greater tools and choices about how they use electricity. Um, this means giving them that minute by minute breakdown of how they use their energy and supplying it to them in a form that, that they can then hand over to third parties, to entrepreneurs who can package it in a way that makes it meaningful to them. Um, so that means an open, non-proprietary format. Um, this might seem like a simple enough thing to do, uh, but utilities are wary of giving customers information about their, their energy usage. And, and this has to do with the history of the industry, where these, these companies have for a very long time held a monopoly over, over the areas that they serve. And so, so giving this information is a threat to their, to their monopoly. Um, to get a fully functional smart grid, uh, customers also have to be given access to time-based pricing. And this is, um, I mean, basically, otherwise there's no incentive for them to do things like charge their cars when the price of energy is low and when demand is low, or uh, to run their dishwasher drink periods when demand is low. Uh, and you basically lose a lot of the benefits of the smart grid. And up until this point, regulators um, have, a few, have refused to allow prices to fluctuate. Again, it has to do with, with the tradition of the industry and, um, and the regulation being set at a time when the priorities, uh, our priorities as a nation, our energy priorities were different. So um, there's a lot of movement happening um, on this front in the, on, in the Obama administration. Um, but as of yet, there have not been there have not been a lot of solutions. There's just been sort of nibbling around the edges of this issue, um, and and so um, it needs to be addressed. I think more squarely. And that's all. <laughs> Thank you for coming. I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you, Mark. I'd like to introduce Robert Lighton, who's the Vice President for Research and Policy at the Ewan Marion Kaufman Foundation. As I mentioned at the beginning, we've appreciated the leadership of Bob and of Kaufman for many years on all aspects of this issue. We appreciated Kaufman sending folks to the New America's Conference in 2006 on entrepreneurship. He's got a broad perspective, and we're really grateful for Bob for being here. So, Bob? Thank you. I apologize for being late. Um, I got lost. Um, and I will uh, attempt to be uh, relatively brief so we can get to Q&A. Um, a lot of the details have been covered. 
um, uh, by Paul Maria. But let me ask or let me address sort of a big picture question, which is uh, to go back to the issue of why should we care about entrepreneurship? Um, so let, let's step back and sort of look at the economy where we are now and ask what's going to happen when the stimulus ends. And by the way, it will end, although I was just in another conversation with somebody uh, in another meeting I was at this morning who said it'll never end. Yeah. Um, uh, that after this is over, there'll be another stimulus, another stimulus, but no, no, there won't be because I think given the budget deficits, there's just no way this, 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 this can go on. Um, and at some point, the whole idea of the stimulus, of course, was to kick into gear the private sector and eventually, you know, the bicycle would start again. All right, that's the whole idea. Well, let's just think conceptually. Go back to elementary macroeconomics and think about what GDP is made of, all right? It's made of consumption plus investment plus exports plus government spending minus imports. All right, it's a famous, famous sort of identity. Now, what's happened to grossly overstate in the last, you know, year and a half is that consumption has fallen through the floor, all right? Savings rates have dramatically skyrocketed for all obvious reasons. So before, consumption was around 70% of GDP. It's now somewhere in the 65% range, all right? And we've made up the difference temporarily to keep the economy from completely cratering by uh, increasing G, all right, government spending, all right? So the question now is, what's going to happen when G goes back down? G is now at 28% of GDP, which is the highest it's been, I think, since, what, World War II. And no one, I think, is for keeping G at 28 Although when we all retire, for those of us who are baby boomers, GZ is going to go to 28 unless we do something about entitlements, but that's not our subject today. All right. But nonetheless, most people think G's got to go down to like 24, 23, something like that. So if G goes down, what goes up? Now, I can tell you one thing that ain't going to go up very much. Consumption's not going to go back to where it was because people are spooked and their savings rate has now gone up. And so the only other way you can get the economy growing again is to get exports going and investment going. Now, I'm not saying that C isn't going to completely come back. It's probably when consumers – think of consumers as basically risk takers too. There's a great book out by a Columbia um, economist named Amar Behide called The Ventures of Economy. And the whole thesis of the book is that view consumers – as, invest, as, 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 as uh, investors with animal spirits. And unless they have animal spirits, they won't take risk either. But nonetheless, we're not going to make up the entire shortfall in G entirely by having consumption increase. So that means we need exports. Well, I can tell you right now, the world is not, the rest of the world is not going to buy our exports unless we let in their imports. So this is not the time for trade war, and yet we're on the verge of it. Um, so that's not good news. And then if we look to investors, if we look to investment, people aren't going to invest, firms aren't going to invest, unless they're confident that people are going to buy the stuff at the end of the day. So that means we're in this vicious cycle where investors aren't going to invest unless consumers are going to buy or unless people in other, in other countries are going to buy, namely exports. So we're in a vicious cycle. How do we get out of it? Well, I'm going to give you a partial answer. Partial answer is people aren't going to be anxious to buy a lot of stuff unless it's new and exciting, all right? And iPod on steroids, all right? You gotta remember, iPod came out uh, during the last recession. And people aren't gonna wanna buy, whether they're here or abroad, new products, new services, or whatever, unless they're really neat. And people have reason to go and have confidence to start buying things. That's a proposition, I think it's true. All right. So where are we going to get these great new things, the great next big things? Well, it's our view of the Kauffman Foundation that historically the most disruptive new technologies are brought forth to us not by big firms but by entrepreneurs. And that's, through, that's true throughout our history. Think about the car, the automobile, the PC, the mainframe computer, all the software technology, the whole Internet stuff, assuming the platform, all the sort of sexy stuff – was brought to you by entrepreneurs. And it's not brought to you largely by big firms who do incremental innovation, but big firms will not generally want to obsolesce what they're already making a bunch of money on now. So if you want, essentially, people to be excited about, about the next big thing, we're going to have to have another entrepreneurial revolution. That's not the only reason. 
We have a study on our website that was done by some economists at the Census Bureau and also the University of Maryland that shows, this is a remarkable statistic, by the way, and it's not widely appreciated, that shows between 1980 and 2005, all of the net new jobs in the United States were created by firms under five years old. That's an amazing statistic. It tells you our economy is incredibly dynamic. And if you only relied on the big firms, we're not going to have full employment. We have to have a continual flow of new firms. Now, the good news is the rate of new firm formation is actually up a little bit since the recession began. But we don't know how many of those are going to flower into really big firms because the economy is really driven not only by just new firms in general, but by the firms of those firms, the future Googles, future Microsofts, Intels, the high growth firms. So that leads us to the view, well, can we just assume that they're automatically going to be created? Well, there is some historical precedent to say that this is going to happen again. Another study that we have on our website, it's done by a colleague of mine named Dane Stangler, looked at the Fortune 500. And he found that half of the Fortune 500 today were formed in a bear market or recession. Another remarkable statistic. We looked at Inc. 500 companies, which are the new high growth companies on, that are published by Inc. Magazine. Same thing. Half of them were formed in a bear market or recession. So if history is any guide, we're going to get rescued by the next wave of entrepreneurs. The only question is, should we just rest on our laurels and assume that history is going to basically produce the next, the next recovery? Um, probably. But I think the role for policy, a lot of us would share this view, is to goose history along or at least give us some insurance that this is going to happen again. And so the kinds of things that Paul was talking about in his opening remark, and also what you were talking about, are the kinds of accelerating phenomena that I think we all ought to be talking about. High-skill immigration, all right? They disproportionately, immigrants disproportionately form new high-growth firms. That's been well documented, all right? So we're all for what Paul talked about. Um, uh, we're all for new platforms being created. Um, although I would drop a footnote, I think more of the new platform story is going to be driven by the rule setting that you talked about than actual money. Uh, because remember, the platform that we have, the so-called Internet, there was a relatively modest amount of government money. It was built by the telecom industry, all right? It's private money. Electricity, we're going to have to have built by private money. I'm going to argue that in the future, I actually believe 20 years down the road, I think roads increasingly are going to be private money because the government is not going to have anything. We're just going to have too many large budget deficits, or we're going to see increased uh, private sector activity. But then that gets to the issue of what are they going to be the rules for the road, so to speak, when these people actually build all this stuff. So yes, platform technologies are important. I want to talk about money. I want to talk about health care. Then I'm going to quit. OK, so the third thing people talk about when they want more entrepreneurship is they want more money. A couple of points here. Do not equate entrepreneurship with venture capital. We have another study on the website that shows, done by Paul Kodrowski, who's a well-known blogger, um, who shows that only 16% of the fastest growing companies in our economy were financed by venture capital. So don't think that by waiving a bunch of rules and figuring out, putting more government money or God knows, I mean, actually be a big, you know, big mistake or whatever you're going to do, don't rely on venture capital to bail us out. What we're going to need is probably some more innovative things. So like you talked about Prosper, really what you're talking about is Prosper.com. Um, we're going to need more liberalization from the SEC to allow more kinds of innovation so that the Internet can allow, whether it's loans or angel investment or venture capital, to have more kinds of Internet-based things. And my view is let's just have an exemption. Um, uh, you know, for twenty five, fifty thousand or below, and not worry and let people take risks. If people want to give money to other people on the internet, let them as long as it's not a lot of money. Okay, I think it's crazy to try to overprotect it and squash that market. But the other answer to the money, speaking of SEC, is how are you going to build a lot of this new clean tech and biotech and nanotech, which is capital intensive? Because VC alone isn't going to do it, and Angel alone isn't going to do it, a lot of these companies are going to have to go public. And here I'm going to tell you, I'm, this is an unorthodox view, I think we ought to think about partially revisiting Sarbanes-Oxley. Not getting rid of it entirely, but you could think, for example, about raising the exemption under Sarbanes-Oxley to maybe from $75 million market cap to maybe a billion market cap so that firms would be able to go to the stock markets and raise the kind of money that we're going to need for the next generation. Another idea that's floating out there, what if you allow firms to opt out of Sarbanes-Oxley? Let the market determine. 
If Sarbanes Oxley is so good and all these requirements are needed, well, then firms will opt into it. But if it's not and the benefits are less than the costs, you'll see firms opting out. So we ought to think about some innovative ways to allow people to access capital markets. That's the thing on money. Let me conclude with just a couple points on health care. I am not a health care maven or a guru, but I want to reinforce something that Paul said. We don't have statistical evidence to document this, but I can tell you anecdotally to all the entrepreneurs that we, that we talk to, health care is a huge problem for small business. It's not just the premiums that they have to pay. It's the fact that you're your proverbial 40-year-old engineer at IBM or Intel or Microsoft or Google who's thinking about starting a business, if they leave that company and they're not already rich, they're going on the individual market, they've got a pre-existing condition, they can't get health care, all right? And so they don't start their business. And we know there are lots of locked-up entrepreneurs in big businesses that are scared like crazy because they're worried about health care for their families. So this is an argument, actually, which I think the Obama administration is way underplayed. I mean, they ought to roll out, they ought to say, look, entrepreneurs create all of our new net, net new jobs. So if we want the economy to get forward, we need to fix health care. I mean, they've been talking over and all about uh, controlling costs and so forth, and CBO has sort of punctured that balloon um, that said so far that what's been talked about has not been controlling costs. Um, but I would say that there ought to be a more affirmative argument grounded in entrepreneurship. Now, once you say that, though, you then can't just say, that you're going to tax entrepreneurs, you know, the pay-to-play 8% kind of thing is the kind of thing that scares entrepreneurs off. The House bill that basically raises marginal rates, you know, to 50% or something close to it, when you add state taxes, it's over that. That's the kind of thing that is anti-entrepreneurial, all right? It is not the way to finance health care, in my view. So I think, and unfortunately the president's in a, in a box on this, but before the presidential election, if you would ask most conservative and liberal economists about how to pay for health care reform, they would have all come up with the same answer. And it would have been limit the tax deductibility on employer-provided health care because it's regressive to basically, or it's regressive to basically allow companies to give gold-plated health care and get rich people big tax deductions. This is nuts. Most people agree that this is the right way to finance it. And unfortunately, the president, during his, his campaign, ran a big commercial against you know, McCain, accusing him of all kinds of heretical things for proposing this. But this is what most people have been saying. In fact, I was just reminded that Jason Furman talked about this before he went and worked for the Obama administration. He's not the only one. And so I think at some point, the administration is going to have to come off the, you know, the campaign statement. I don't know how he's going to have to do it, but somehow, He's going to have to retract that statement or at least accept what Congress does. Now, I know Baucus said that they'll never, wait, they'll never be able to get approval uh, for limiting tax deductibility, but frankly, all these other schemes, you know, raising surtaxes and fiddling around with Medicare and doing all this stuff is not going to pay for big grant health care. It isn't unless you do the employer tax deductibility. And finally, I've got the time thing. I would say if you can't enact the whole enchilada, and get total universal coverage for everybody with a big, you know, gold-plated plan, think about some fallbacks, a scaled-back plan. And so I'm attracted as a fallback to maybe having a minimum catastrophic plan. And cut the cost that way. If you want to mandate it, fine. And you may find it a lot easier to finance if you start small and at least have, give everybody catastrophic health care coverage. And maybe we can work to something that's more expansive. But really, if you talk to small business, that's really what they're worried about. They're worried about their patients or their, excuse me, their, their workers getting cancer or some dreaded disease, and then they go bankrupt and can't pay for it. We've got to solve that problem as a country, and it's pro-entrepreneurial. Thanks. Thank you, Bob. Well, we've got about 20 minutes for, uh, for Q&A, and I think Emily's got a mic here, uh, and, and as we go around, you just raise your hand, identify where you're, um, where you're from, and, um, and state your question. Gentleman in the front row. I'm Dr. Herbert Rust, uh, locally, and uh, Bob, I'd like to address one point in terms of the health care. It's my point of view that health care should be totally disassociated from the employment market. The only thing that should require to get to health care for yourself or your family is being a U.S. citizen. Yep. If you're a citizen, you get a health care card, and you're covered. Your wife gets a health care card, and she's covered. The new baby that was born last month gets a health care card, and it's covered, period. Let's knock out this nonsense about having to be associated with where you work or 
a company you work for or any other employment option. Mm -hmm. Bob, you want to respond? Uh, we have something that says something almost identical to that on our website. I mean, if we could start over, I would agree 100 percent. This was a terrible mistake to tie this to, how, to, to the employment situation. It's just that politically it may be very difficult to unwind it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is interesting. Washington's in a challenge where you'd love to be able to uh, marry some of the do no harm part. I mean, the, the healthcare piece does have, have potential to do harm to entrepreneurship at the same time as some of these other ideas that we've talked about here that the administration is talking about has the ability to do, to do well. The, the irony, I think Greg and some of the other bills have that um, re reduction of the, uh, the employer deductibility piece uh, with, without the 8 percent pay and play and the, um, in, in, in the huge uh, and the tax piece on, on some of the um, higher income piece, which would be unpopular with entrepreneurs. And you could get some sort of grand scheme bargain, uh, pro-entrepreneurial, pro-growth, pro-job creation uh, package, but um, I'm not optimistic. Yeah. Further questions? Yeah. Uh, David Hart, George Mason University. Um, I want to key in on the word platforms and explore that a little bit. Um, is there a generic principle about, about who should own the platforms? I guess we heard Bob's view that it would be privately owned and then access would be regulated. This is a you know, broad question. Energy, healthcare, IT, I mean, all of them, telecom, have this quality. Whether you guys have a, a general view about that, what's the best thinking on that subject? It's mm -hmm. a great question. Anyone want to? Right. Well, in terms, in terms of energy, I mean, at this point, power companies own the platform, um, and I think that there's, there's no there's very little chance that the, that the wires will ever belong to anybody but individual um, power companies that have uh, regulated monopolies. Um, I think the big question with, with that platform is um, who has access to the information once you add digital intelligence um, to the grid. And um, I think our position is that, that consumers should have access to the information and the information should be in a format um, that that data can then be packaged and used by third parties. Um, so if a, if a consumer wants to have an Internet portal to manage their energy, they should be able to pick who provides that Internet portal for them. It shouldn't be the power company making the decision. Or, I mean, they should be given the information in the first place and then they should be able to pick how to use it because that, um, that opens the field for entrepreneurs to create all kinds of, all kinds of software, all kinds of um, services to to help people use energy more efficiently. So, and it also it also you probably get better results. You probably get more efficiency. So, yeah, I'm I'm not sort of knowledgeable enough to lift it to the level of broad principle, but I know that there are a lot of other examples of of what Mariah is saying. Um, if you look at the healthcare IT sector, we have a cover story by the New America's uh, my fellow fellow Phil Longman on uh, what. Uh, the barriers are to the use of healthcare IT, the deployment of healthcare IT, to get all the benefits that Obama and others have talked about in terms of lower costs, higher quality, and so forth. And if the system is, if we have a healthcare IT system dominated by proprietary software companies, each of which um, keeps the information within the little silo of the hospital or doctor group that purchases the, soft, uh, the software, you don't get the sharing of data that is the basis of being able to mine the data, look at the patterns, and change uh, uh, protocols and payment uh, regimes such that you're rewarding good practice and efficient practice and not rewarding ineffective uh, practice. So it's not so much a question of whether there's ownership it's a question of whether the platform itself is open to competition, open for inspection, sort of open in general. I think that's that would be the the principle. Um, pe people who advocates of the of the smart grid of a sort of an open smart grid often compare it to the iPhone store. And iPhone, yeah. I mean, that platform is actually owned by Apple, but it's open in a way that allows just phenomenal innovation. So I think maybe that's that's the clearest parallel. Mm -hmm. Other questions. Let's see if there's another question, then if not, uh, maybe we'll follow up. I didn't see too many hands. It's, I think right over here. Yeah. It's right there. Get the microphone. and. and. Hi, I'm Sadia. I saw in the post today that um, there is less approval for the health care reform. And do you have any ideas about what that's tied to? Is it tied to maybe Republicans not 
being on board with some of the deficit spending, or could it be seasonal because there's less um, job recovery during the summer? I mean, um, the, the overall op opposition to the, the House and, and, and Senate bills? Um, well, what I read is that there's less public approval uh, for yeah. um, well, health care reform at this time. You mentioned the CBO time. numbers, and that's... Well, I, I believe, I could be wrong about this, but I believe that the the decline has been in the, in faith in Barack Obama to pull it off, but the desire for health care reform is, I think, remained the same. I could be wrong, but I think that's Well, I think that's true, but I'll tell you, now that the rubber's hitting the road, I, I knew this was coming. Uh, eventually, we're going to have to have the conversation on how we're going to pay for it. And now you're seeing ads. All right, I just heard one this morning I hadn't heard before about from the soft drink industry. Have you heard this one? You know, God, it was on TV, you know, God forbid, don't, don't use, don't, don't make us pay, you know, we all like our soft drinks. But you know what, you can just multiply these ads because every way and shape that you figure out how to pay for it, somebody's ox is going to get bored. Mm -hmm. And that, once that happens, that's when, report, that's when support starts to splinter. And um, I knew that day was going to come because it's great to say abstractly we're all for health care reform and we want, you know, insurance. But then when we get to hell, we're going to pay for it. That This was to be expected. And so that's why I think, I mean, again, I don't want us to give up. And I don't think the administration should box itself into the corner politically where if it doesn't get the whole enchilada, then it's viewed as a failure. Because I think they need something. We need something. <laughs> Everybody needs something. And that's why I was going to say maybe one of those somethings is what about a bare-bones catastrophic policy? If we could get that and it wouldn't cost so much, then maybe it would mitigate some of the arguments, you know, some of the, you know, the, uh, the opposition about paying for it. Because part of this is driven by the huge cost, the trillion dollars blew, you know, it's blown a lot of people's minds. Mm -hmm. Very good. All right. So the gentleman here, and I see another hand in the back here. So the gentleman on my right. Thanks. Hi, Stu I have a philosophical question. I'm not quite sure how to phrase it, but uh, it has to do with supply and demand of innov innovation. If you look over the last hundred years or whenever, <coughs> we never knew we needed cars. We never knew we needed telephones. We never knew we needed computers. We never knew we needed a search function, for goodness, or Twitter or anything. <laughs> and they came. Mm -hmm. Now you seem to have an inverse of that. Everyone's asking for a smart grid. They're asking for electric vehicles. They're asking for these things. Does that say anything about innovation and its likelihood of occurring? Hmm. That's a great question. Because one of the things that we talk about at Kaufman is that if you had to def – there's a zillion definitions of an entrepreneur. But one definition is an entrepreneur made you need something that you never thought you needed. Mm -hmm. All right? And so by definition, it's unplanned. And um, – and so once you get into a world in which, you know, you're planning things, um, it's sort of, quote, anti-entrepreneurial. But having said that, I think Mariah is right, and there are examples. There are certain things that we can see that there are huge benefits to having a platform because lots of things hang from the platform. And so in that sense, um, in that sense, I think maybe we're at a different stage where we, where we can see the bold outlines that we need the platform, but we can't see all the ways it's going to be used, right? And that's the unplanned part. Right. Yeah. The internet's part of that too, right? You yeah. Know, the government's interest in forming that. Yeah, and I, I think I think that we're at this period. This is what I was trying to kind of articulate in, 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 in when, before was that there we're down to kind of the hard problems. Um, we could be wholly wrong about the smart grid. Um, I don't think we are. Enough people have looked at it over enough years to know that this is an area that shouldn't be immune to the digital <coughs> revolution. And um, we can't imagine all that could arise from a digitized electric grid. Um, and maybe it won't be as, as profound as, as we think and hope. Um, but having not there, – there's just certain things that aren't going to happen – that our entrepreneurs can't make happen. Uh, absent the transcontinental railroad, which was a huge investment at the time, and and was uh, built, no private sector person would have spent the money to do that um, because the payback was over decades, really, and you got really the industrialization and the the settlement of much of the Midwest and the West thanks to the transcontinental railway, um, but. 
people had known for some time that that was something that needed to be done. The, the you know, roads, canals, uh, the, the rural electrification, these are things that um, absent government's hand, you're not, you're, you're, you can't expect private uh, investment to do. And so I, I think it's, it's these sort of uh, hard cases that, that we've been trying to suss out, at least in our work. Well, I'm going to just ask a follow-up on a demographic question about who are the entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. If we rip up the roads anyway with safety and transportation money to rebuild infrastructure, we might as well put in the, the wires, as Paul indicated, to create universal broadband. I think that has an a, a additional benefit uh, for uh, women in terms of workplace flexibility and job uh, working from home, creating businesses uh, uh, while starting a family for men as well, but I mean, there may be an advantage. Uh, to broaden our definition of entrepreneurs, which we often think about, you know, maybe an 18-year-old sitting in, in, in his garage. Uh, and the other demographic I'm interested in terms of is, is older Americans who may be working uh, longer but want to work in a different way, uh, driven by uh, a variety of factors, need to work longer but a desire to have workforce attachment. Do we see a broadening of the diversity of entrepreneurs in America? And, um, and if so, is policy going to uh, help broaden that? Okay, I'll make it quick, but there's data on all this on our website. We have something called the Kauffman Entrepreneurial Index, which tracks by demographic group, by, by demographic group the rate of new business formation. Now, now we get into the question of well, who's an entrepreneur, right? Not every small business, in, in my view, is an entrepreneur. I mean, we reserve that label for people that are doing something really new and innovative. But there are still zillions of small businesses. And so a lot of the people that you're talking about, people my age and older, let's say, um, we may be doing consulting on a lot of other things. Uh, we're not classically inventing something new, but if you look at the age distribution of people that are sort of own their own business, um, it starts low, gets higher in the middle age groups, then goes down a little bit, and then starts to go back up again um, in older Americans, and I think you'll see that uh, trend accelerate. But I will conclude with this thought. If you look at the high growth, most successful entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. the median age of that person who founds that company or when they found it, is 40 years old. Mm. It's, not, it's not the guy in the garage at yeah. 18 years old. Right. Good, good. We have the hand in the back there, gentlemen. Anthony Kalanoki. Um, several items on my mind. Number one, our nation is getting old. Uh, we are not thinking young anymore. Foreign technology is developing all the new ideas, like hydrogen-powered cars that the Chinese have, hydrogen-powered buses in Iceland right now. We have nothing in, along those lines. Electric cars, I don't see any future for, because if you're out of electricity, you're out of it. Hydrogen-powered car, basically water-powered. We should be working on that. Uh, number two, on health care. We have the most inefficient system in the world by far, because we have over 100,000 businesses. It's a business for us. National health care. Okay, we, have, we pay twice as much as the next highest paying country per capita for health care. Uh, we have to do like Canada did, like Mexico is doing, I, I believe. And, um, but my main concern is, okay, the Airbus industry, A380, largest air, airplane in the world, will be flying on Algia fuel to Oshkosh, Wisconsin in about 10 days. Algia fuel, what are we doing? Uh, one more item, uh, and I'm going to stop at this. Solar power, it is highly efficient. The sun shines most of the time in most places. Uh, 600 million, okay, we began this in California in the 1980s. Who is building it right now? In Brazil, $600 million solar collector, big mirrors plant, and also in Spain. We're doing nothing with this, with our own ideas. We need to start enterprise. Uh, developing ideas and uh, and building them and yeah. selling them. Amen, amen. Let's take another question. I saw another hand out front. Yep, the gentleman down here, and then we'll we can respond to solar hydrogen and others if you like, along with this one. Hi, Daniel Harmon from the Center for American Progress, and just a quick question. There's been a lot of emphasis on, you know, giving the energy companies lots of money to install these digital technologies to help their efficiency, but there hasn't been, you know, a huge effort by the energy companies to actually implement this on their own. So how would there be maybe a consumer way of, you know, a lot of people have been starting to install solar panels on their own roofs or mm -hmm. on the, their lots nearby their house. How would 
maybe getting consumers more energized to adopt these sort of technologies. Any thoughts from the panel? That's from you, you should have come to the previous uh, Washington <laughs> Monthly uh, yeah. event when Mariah talked about feed-in tariffs, which yes. is the, uh, the yeah. uh, short answer. Again, again, um, again, policy, I think, is oftentimes the driver. So um, if you look at the countries where that you have the widest spread deployment of renewable energy, it's, it's purely a function of policy. And the policy that's most effective is, uh, is the feed-in tariff, which is um, – that's maybe a matter for a different day, but essentially it's a policy where anybody who produces renewable energy can sell it into the grid for a price that's based on the cost of production. Um, does that answer your question? That's a good start. Yeah, it's a good. Question. Any other um, any other questions, yeah. gentlemen? Here, and then we'll try your follow up. If you still have it, yeah, I haven't forgotten you. Um, my name's uh, Chuck Devine. Um, I'm just. I won't mention my organization, but one of the things that those of us in tech fields are noticing is that uh, the reason you're seeing like 60% of foreigners getting the advanced degrees is because Americans are becoming aware of, shall we say, uh, dysfunctional management, dysfunctional organizations, and they're starting to stay away from tech fields. It's not so much that the uh, foreigners bring are so much better than we are, it's just that we know these industries too much and are staying away from them. Great. Any comments on that? Let's take this, take the follow-up question, then come back as we as we uh, conclude here with the two final questions here. Well, my question is generic follow-up. If you allow access and, and open up the information to these platforms, then what's the incentive to invest, or should it simply be mandated? I think there's a box there that we haven't figured out how to, how to solve. Okay, all right. So yeah, Chuck's question there, looking at some of the management techniques and how it might affect, as well as the second one about some of the disincentives to invest. I'll take the, the uh, right. science and engineers. I, I don't think we fully understand completely why a lot of our kids aren't doing it. Um, for a while we did, in the sense that, I mean, I'll take, for example, my son, who was an engineering major. During the bubble boom, they all went to Wall Street. The smartest ones to, went, went to Wall Street. They did. I'm, I'm actually quite serious. I mean, Wall Street invaded the engineering schools in America and basically enticed them to come, all right? And now that's not happening. So we are going to get a test now and see whether those kids are going to go work. And so you're going to get a test of your hypothesis. Um, and we don't know yet. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, so I'm aware of some research that indicates that really, people really are fed up with bad work-life balance and really atrocious matters. Yeah, so that could be. But I will give you one other theory which I've read, and I don't know whether it's true, but, you know, the Indias, the Chinas of the world, the Japans, and so forth, once you, your income per capita grows and you get closer to the, to the frontier, ironically, um, a lot of the kids in the next generations do not do hard science. It, the kid, it's, the, it's the countries in the catch-up phase that do it because they see that as a way to basically advance themselves. But now I've read, for example, you know, k Japanese kids who were the, you know, the Chinese of the 20 years ago, they're not going as heavily into engineering. And it's, 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 it's cultural, and people gravitate to other things. I don't have a perfect explanation for it, but it does seem to be happening. Interesting. Okay. Paul, am I, any final words? Uh, we are pro-algae at the Washington Monthly. We have a, 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 a story, in fact, on, on uh, second-generation biofuels in our current issue. I, I urge you to read it. Um, it. In terms of how you make money in an open source platform. I think that's a really great question. There's a book out by the uh, editor of Wired Magazine called Free that sort of uh, uh, pushes this notion around a bit. And it, it, it's, a, it's a little bit more optimistic than, than I am in, ter in terms of exactly what the models are. But you know, in the case of the, of the power industry, um, the utilities have um, government-sanctioned ability to extract dough from us yeah. through through rates so I don't think there's any any um, I don't think there's any risk uh, there um, in terms of uh, some of the other sectors I think we don't know what the business models is my own business we don't know uh, in, in journalism what the business model when you open things up uh, is but um, uh, in healthcare IT for instance you will see if you go to if the government were to mandate uh, interoperability uh, among all the different systems, you might see the melting away of a lot of um, fairly large 
health IT companies. But what you'll see in response is the creation of a lot of entrepreneurial enterprises that help customize the open source IT for your specific needs. IBM essentially got out of the proprietary software business, I don't know, 5 to 10, 15 years ago. And they now help customers by packaging op essentially open source software for their business needs. So there's a business there. At least IBM has found it. And, and I would like to just add to what Paul said about in, in the power industry in particular, you have these, these are regulated monopolies. So, so regulators set the rates, and, and at the moment, the rates are tied to how much energy they produce. So creating the incentive to invest in smart grid technology is as simple as, as changing the incentive structure. So the incentive isn't just to generate more electricity, but to use energy more efficiently. So that's actually totally in the power of regulators in, in this particular case. Great. All right, well, I think we've highlighted some of the important uh, areas here, and I know uh, we'll continue to, to do so here. I want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank Paul and Mariah and Bob for sharing their wisdom with us. Uh, we're concluded, and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.